Uh, and this should be cherry now. Perfect. Okie dokes. Okay, good. All right. Good. So, so I think uh, we're just about ready to start. <laughs> it's quite everything. So, good morning, folks. Or good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to another one of our series of talks on artificial intelligence and machine learning. These talks are jointly sponsored by Metron Incorporated and uh, George Mason University. Uh, our speaker today will be uh, Professor Hector Munoz Avila of Lehigh University. And the title of this talk is Automated Learning and Hierarchical Planning Models. Now, Dr. Munoz Avila is a professor of computer science and engineering and uh, cognitive science at Lehigh University. He is also a co director of the Institute for Data, Intelligence Systems, and Computation. Dr. Mino Savila is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award and held the Lehigh Class of 1961 professorship. He's been chair for various international scientific meetings, including the 6th International Conference on Case-Based Reasoning and the 25th Innovative Applications of AI Conference. Dr. Mino Savila served as the Program Director of Robust Intelligence at the National Science Foundation. He has been funded by the Office of Naval Research, National Science Foundation, DARPA, the Naval Research Laboratory, and the Air Force Research Laboratory. Effective Professor Dinos and Bill. Thank you very much, Larry, and, and thank you everyone for, for, uh, for having me. Um, so um, I, what I'm going to be talking is, um, um, I will be saying we, 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 and, and I really meant that there is a number of people who have collaborated on this research, uh, people at uh, national labs like David Aja, at other universities, uh, in, in, uh, in companies in the DC area, and, and a number of PhD students who worked with me in the past on, on these topics. So, so this is really a royal we uh, when I explain this work. Uh, I have worked on this topic of learning hierarchical models for more than 20 years. And um, I'm going to give an, uh, first uh, an overview of why this topic is, is so interesting and I have spent so much time working on it um, in, in, um, in explain how you know, there are two aspects of learning the, these hierarchical models. One is the applicability conditions and the other one is the hierarchy themselves. And I'm going to uh, cherry pick a few of the works that I have done over the years on this. Uh, and then I will make some final remarks. So before, before I start, let me describe in one slide my general interest. I work on, on AI and machine learning. I work on, on what is called theory of, of computation, which refers to things like computational complexity, uh, but that I aim towards uh, AI problems. Um, then I work on constructing systems, and that translates in some of the courses that I teach uh, at Lehigh University. Um, so the topic today is, is uh, this topic, learning hierarchical knowledge. That's, that's a central topic that, that I've been working on and, and that will be the focus of this presentation. So let me start by motivating the work. So uh, suppose that, and, and of course nowadays everything is virtual, but um, um, I imagine that if uh, at some point I'll be happy to visit Metron uh, and I have to plan how to get there from Lehigh to Metron. And, and you know, if I have a Lehigh in the building, I will have to walk out of the door in the building, open the door, then drive uh, to local street, Culture Street, then take 22. Uh, there is an airport here and, and take airplane and so forth. So there will be a sequence of, of steps that I will follow. Um, this will be a plan that I'm executing. Now, somebody who is observing me performing these activities might want to make some sense of what is really that I'm doing in, in this series of actions that I'm taking. So somebody is saying, oh, this part of the action, this part of the plan, uh, Hector is trying to get into the car. That's what he's doing. Uh, this part of the plan, oh, he's taking the local route. Uh, this part of the plan, oh, now he's going through the highway. Um, and one could further characterize uh, in a more abstract level uh, what is going on, saying, oh, this part of the plan, all of this is actually is driving to the airport. 
Uh, then he's turning to the airport and, oh, I see, he's trying to get to me. So, so, so the, this is the kind of uh, hierarchy that we are interested in, in learning. Um, and uh, the general plan that we have been working on is how to learn these hierarchies automatically. So this is a, an, an interesting challenge. And, and the input for the learning problem is basically this collection of traces that we that I showed at the beginning. We give a number of those traces, and then uh, uh, there are other inputs that I will discuss. And based on the inputs, then in these traces and inputs, we are trying to learn this this hierarchy automatically. Um, so um, some uh, notation that I will be using, and I'll be repeating this notation over and over. Um, uh, these uh, um, activities at the beginning, they are called actions. They're also called primitive tasks. So they are tasks, but they are primitive. They, are the they don't they get decomposed. They, they, they correspond to actions. So primitive tasks and actions are synonyms. And then we have these compound tasks. And compound tasks is because they can be decomposed into other tasks. So, so in compound tasks, we continue decomposing them. Whereas the primitive tasks are the actions. That's when we basically are done with the decomposition process. This is a standard hierarchical task network planning or HTM planning terminology. Um, then uh, when we take a task and decompose into two subtasks, this is called a task decomposition. Okay. So um, this hierarchical task network or HTM planning, the aim is to take a complex task and decompose it into simpler tasks. So we have a, a compound task and decompose into simpler tasks. If any of these tasks is compound, then you keep uh, decomposing them until eventually you reach these primitive tasks, which define actions changing the world. Um, so there are two basic sources of knowledge in HCM planning. Uh, one are the operators, which are used to achieve the primitive tasks. Um, um, and the one are the methods which are used to decompose the compound tasks. So if you use an HCM planner and you have to, um, uh, and, and then you will need basically two kinds of knowledge constructs that you need to encode, manually encode the operators and the methods. Um, so before I go into more detail, let me discuss why the interest on HTM planning, hierarchical task network planning. Uh, there are three main reasons for that. One is the expressiveness. So there is a number of theoretical works that have shown that HTM planning is strictly more expressive than classical planning representations. Classical planning as in strips planning. Um, and uh, that means when we have the methods and operators, one will be able to express some knowledge that is impossible to express with operators only. So um, here is a very simple example. Um, um, I don't do research on computer games, but I do a lot of research using computer games uh, to illustrate my AI algorithms. Uh, this is a computer game called Unreal Tournament. And I don't want to get into details of the game, but there are some locations. And for example, we would like one of the automated agents to um, uh, repeatedly go back and forth between two locations an arbitrary number of times. That's an example of something that could be easily expressed in HTM planning and is not really expressible using a strict planning representations unless the end is fixed. So that's an example. So, so takeaway here is, I can express uh, complex strategies if you want. Um, and, and that's one reason why people use HGM planning. Uh, the other one is applications. There are a number of applications uh, that are naturally suited to this hierarchical decomposition. So for example, there are a number of military operations uh, that are expressed in, in, in this hierarchical fashion. Back in the days when I was a postdoc, uh, we, uh, I was working at the Naval Research Lab, um, and uh, we were looking at something called a particular kind of military operations called non-combatant evacuation operations. 
uh, there is a tornado or some kind of calamity in other country, and then uh, one needs to evacuate people, uh, U.S. nationals or other uh, nationals. Um, so it's, it's the military has performed the operation, but it's really not combatant because it's mostly evacuation. And there is something called a joint task list. Um, and, and the kind of knowledge that expressed there is really hierarchical in, in the terms of, of the decision making. Uh, digital games, again, there are a number of those. These are two commercial games. I have not really followed recently, but there are two at least two commercial games that use hierarchical planning uh, techniques for, for encoding these strategies. And there are a number of researchers and practitioners who use it for activities like UAV control, robotics, manufacturing, project planning, and others. So, so there is a number of applications that are of interest. And the third reason why HCN planning is available is, is the, the efficiency. So um, if uh, the methods and operators are carefully crafted, one could get uh, um, high performance. And performance here means uh, you know, very rapid uh, planning time or perhaps include or inc and or uh, uh, reduced cost. It may be even optimal relative to some um, uh, metric. So those are the three main reasons why people are interested in HTM planning. Um, the, there are two big caveats here. Uh, the first one is uh, HTM planning to work well, it needs this background knowledge. It needs not background knowledge, the knowledge, the, the knowledge about what are the tasks, uh, what are the task decompositions, and what are the applicability conditions for those task decompositions. So the what, how, and when. And um, so, so that's one caveat. The second caveat is that not all problems are amenable to hierarchical representations. Um, so this is a, a, a toy domain that is frequently used in the AI literature. It's called Blocks Word. Um, um, I don't want to get in, into details of, of the domain, just to say that this is domain uh, is kind of puzzle. You have to solve a little puzzle to solve it. And, um, and this kind of puzzle really is not quite amenable to hierarchical planning. Or if you want to, for example, plan to whether a number is prime or not, um, that's another problem that would not be really amenable for hierarchical representations. So, so it's not a magic bullet that will work in every domain, but there are many domains, as I mentioned in previous slides, that, that have these, that are amenable to these hierarchical representations, and those are the ones that I am interested in in this in this line of research. So I'm going to give an overview of our research on HCN learning. Uh, uh, again, just re remind of terminology. We have a task that is compound. We use a method to decompose this task into subtasks. I sometimes write the skeletal method. The skeletal method means I know how to decompose the task into subtasks, but I don't know the applicability conditions for that, for applying that method. So basically a learning problem where I want to learn when can I apply this task decomposition. In that case, I will give as input the, the skeletal method. We have the primitive tasks, which corresponds to the actions. And we typically are having a state, perform a primitive task or action, move forward the state, perform a primitive task or action, move the state and so forth. And the state is a collection of atoms conditions like for example ad matron, ad matron um, or ad lehigh so those are the conditions that define the state um, so every state would change some of the atoms and move forward and the final state is one where the atoms there will be the ones that i'm interested in, or at least one of those the, what is called the goal is the one that i'm interested in okay so uh, another uh, quick terminology, we have the tasks and we have something called annotated tasks. An annotated task basically provides a description of what the task means. Uh, so we have the task here to travel a person to a location. Um, in case you have not seen this question mark, uh, this indicates that P is a variable and L is a variable. So um, this is um, something, uh, is still, many people, many of us use it, um, but the origin of this is an arcane programming language called Lisp. Um, in, in, in many of the AI origins come from, from those languages, so we still have that. I don't use Lisp 
anymore, but, but the, some of the language um, representations are still used in, in a lot of these conventions. Anyway, we have the, the, um, the, uh, the task and is defined by some preconditions under which the task is applicable and some effects that will indicate uh, what, are, what happens after you execute the task. So some of the problems that I've been looking at, I give as input a task description, uh, uh, annotated task, meaning the task, the preconditions and effects. So I know um, when the task is applicable in an state and when it terminates. Um, um, when we establish these annotated tasks, we start digging in literature and we find out that people who work in areas such as process models, they use that. Uh, I don't know if they call it, I don't remember if they call it annotated task, but they use the same, the same concept. So, so you have seen, you have studied process models before, you will say, oh yeah, I have seen that before. Yes, so, so we didn't invent that. Uh, this has been used for years for process modeling. Um, so there are, uh, so I mentioned, I, I have a study, um, a number of variants of this HDN or hierarchical learning problem. Um, and, and these are the, the possible elements that I want to mention. One common, one common element from all of the learning problems that I have studied is, I give a, a simple a collection of plans. The sequence of actions, for example, driving the one that I show from, from the high to metron, and, and I give a number of those, and that, that's always a common occurrence. Um, now, there, there are some, some difference there. I mentioned that the, state, the actions or the plan is annotated by, by intermediate states. And in some situations, we assume that the state is fully observable. In other instances, we have, observed, we have assumed that it's not fully observable, that we only observe some of the conditions in the state. Um, other, other considerations in some problems, we, in some of the learning instances, uh, we have given the tasks, and sometimes we have given the annotated tasks. Um, in some of the instances, the problem, we have given the operators as input, the ones that transform the, the state, uh, or we give a skeletal operators where we know the name of the operator, but we don't know the preconditions and effects. We have explored uh, situations where the uh, action, the domain is deterministic. That is to say, when I, uh, like, like chess, right? When in chess, before I move one piece, uh, I, I make a mental uh, thinking in my head, how I'm going to move the piece. And I know immediately what will be the immediate effect of moving that piece, that's deterministic. Um, whereas there are other games that are non-deterministic, where there are multiple possible outcomes. So I, I plan to make a movement, but um, uh, there are outcomes that, that may change. Any of you who might have played a game um, like, um, like a first-person shooter game, in, in um, you uh, fire your weapon at, at some character, uh, the amount of damage is actually uh, corresponding to some random variable. And in that case, it's non-deterministic because even if, if it hits the character, uh, the amount of damage changes. So that would be an example of a non-deterministic domain. Um, so uh, other, other parts of the learning problem is it has the compositions and the uh, applicability conditions. In some of the problems, I give it as the compositions and I learn the applicability conditions. Others, I give the applicability conditions and learn it as the compositions. And in others, we learn both. Uh, there are some objectives. Of course, we want to learn methods, um, but there are two different objectives that we may have. I may just want to generate methods that are uh, correct, the plans generated are correct, in other circumstances, I may, I, I may not be satisfied with just uh, correct. I may want some, the plans to have some quality considerations. For example, the plans generated uh, are, are optimal according to some performance metric. So those are variants of those, okay? So with that, let me give you an, an overview of the kind of research that, that we have performed over the years. Um, uh, I put here some of the, of the conferences where this is, uh, published. So um, the uh, one of the earlier problems that we studied is one where we give us into the operators and the skeletal methods, meaning we know the task decomposition, but we don't know the applicability conditions and we learn the methods. So methods here is because we have the, the, the hierarchy, but we don't know the preconditions. And we have 
a few variants of that. And uh, some of those use something called ontological reasons, ontological reasoning um, in, in the context of now semantic web and that kind of thing does use ontologies. So, so assume that this is given, but no operator, so we have studied that. Um, every time, that, sometimes I present that people are surprised saying, but how can you assume that the hierarchies are given as input? Um, and there are some domains where the hierarchies are given as input and, and we have studied those. Um, uh, this is a snapshot of a tool called Microsoft Project. And in Microsoft Project, you write something called a word breakdown structure and where you have a series of activities and you have an ordering of the activities, this is representable as a hierarchical plan. And we did it. So we, we had a, uh, a path, we have some software that, that will take this and represent it as a hierarchy. And, and so that's what, and what we wanted to do is basically to reuse these project plans for other activities. But in order to reuse it, we wanted to learn the applicability conditions. Um, and, and basically, in this case, were the resources that were annotated. So, so that's where the motivation for that work. Uh, we have also the standard problem of giving the operators and the annotated tasks and learning methods. Um, we also have work in, when the operators are non-deterministic and learning methods for non-deterministic operators. That's a whole different um, uh, problem. Uh, just a quick, uh, I already mentioned this, but the idea of non-determinism is uh, I am in a, in a state and I execute the action and they give me multiple possible outcomes for that action. That's what non-determinism means. Uh, then uh, different variants where um, I will no longer give the operators, but just uh, uh, some uh, skeletal operators. I only know the name of the operator, not the preconditions and effects and I learned both the methods and the operators. Other variant where I am interested now in, I give the operators, but I, and now I'm, I give a, a, perform a, a, a performance metric, a cost, and now the method that I want to learn has to adhere to some quality, take this cost into account, generate um, not necessarily optimal, but at least good quality solutions. Uh, more recently, we have looked into uh, non deterministic operators giving in, in using some statistical methods. And, 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 and more recently, we, we have, of course, we are living in this deep learning revolution. So um, uh, we, we give a simple reward function, and what we learn is a collection of methods, but they are basically encoded in one of these deep learning net networks. Um, so, what I'm going to do in the rest of the presentation is um, I'm going to cherry pick some of these works and go in, in a little bit more detail. Um, and, but I'll be happy during the question answers to talk about any of the others. Uh, of course, there are references for, for all of them. And um, anyway, so let me start with the first problem that we look at, which is the learning of the applicability conditions. So we are giving the hierarchies like in, in Microsoft Project, work breakdown structures, but we are interested in learning when can I apply a particular decomposition or when can I not apply a particular decomposition. So, so we, uh, here is an instance of the problem. Uh, we basically observe uh, a trans in the hierarchy of transportation tasks, some from package uh, from Bethlehem to Pittsburgh, and I observe some, some conditions in the state and there are some subtasks. So this is the actual decomposition. And this is the, um, the conditions, basically the resources in, in the work breakdown structure. An immediate idea, of course, would be to generalize, right? So this was a package. Then, then I convert this into a variable. This is a city and this is another city. I convert it into a variable. Uh, then I add conditions. This should be a package. This should be a city. Um, there should be a track um, and do the same with the subtask. So this is what is called generalization. Um, uh, that's a particular trivial instance of, of a general method called inductive logic programming, uh, which is more complicated than, or more complex than that. Um, but this is a particular instance of that. Just taking the constants and replacing them with, with variables. 
So now you have a method and you could apply it in different instantiations, different problems, not just this one of moving the package 100 from Bethlehem to Pittsburgh, I could apply it for different others, for, for different, uh, or, or, the, or the different problems. Um, so, um, uh, see, see here are the, the variables that I use to uh, generalize the, the constants. So the, the problem there, when I, when, I, when I do that kind of generalization, is I, I have the concrete decomposition. So I went from, from Bethlehem to Pittsburgh. Um, and, um, and I given a, a new problem. Uh, but now I generalize it and, and have this method which have these, these um, uh, generalized conditions. Uh, and in doing so, I, I'm losing information, right? Because uh, this concrete decomposition was going from Bethlehem to Pittsburgh. Um, and now uh, that information basically is lost. Now you, you can have any two cities. Um, and the problem is, in some instances, it might be incorrect because you know the, this this travel is basically taking a truck. And what happened is, city one is Bethlehem and city two is London. Then you can no longer take that 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 kind of um, that kind of uh, application. In that case, it would not work. Um, so um, so then uh, the idea that we have for this solving is okay. So we have one method and we start generalizing one one, one trace. And we start generalizing. Presumably there will be many errors, many information will be lost. But as we have more traces and more traces, we can start learning and discerning between the different conditions. So we have the original bindings, the original constants that we're using the concrete decomposition. Um, we are assuming we have a type ontology. So we know, for example, that a vehicle is a type of tanker or uh, the tanker is a kind of vehicle. So we have some, some, some um, and, and we can use that to uh, annotate these methods. Uh, so we have one method where we have deliver, uh, uh, deliver uh, some has to deliver uh, some, some uh, item to some location. And the original conditions is uh, we have a tanker and the tanker of course can carry liquids. And I have another method that has something called a refrigerated tanker um, and, uh, and is carrying perishable liquid like something like milk. Um, so then um, I have a problem where I want to uh, deliver milk from, from between two locations. And I have a regular tanker and I have a refrigerated tanker. And then the question is, um, which one should I choose? Um, if I write the methods that is written here, the planner will basically pick one arbitrarily. Uh, and, and of course, it picks this one, it will be incorrect. If it picks this other one, it will be correct. So, um, uh, but it turned out that only the second method is the one I should use. If I pick the first method, then um, uh, you know, and it's a long travel, then, then, then the, the milk will be spoiled and, and, and the plan will be incorrect. Um, so what we did is um, as we are learning more conditions, we start annotating the methods with, with conditions. So we have what is called preferences, uh, as opposed to the conditions. The conditions are hard conditions, but the preference indeed what it says, I, if I have two methods, I, I will select the one that has no preference. So first, I may annotate them with the original bindings from which this method was learned. So we run the original bindings, and these are preferences. It's not a hard constraint. Um, but I also have other types of preferences. So, so if I have this method and I, and I know I have another method where a refrigerated tanker is used, I may use this difference between the two. This one's just a tanker and this one's a refrigerated tanker. I may annotate in, in our algorithm actually annotates automatically um, that uh, this vehicle should not be uh, a refrigerated, the, the, whatever your transport uh, is, the, this vehicle is not of type refrigerated tanker and this uh, liquid is not perishable liquid. Uh, and this is basically automatically learned by extrapolating, uh, looking at the type ontology and um, extrapolating the difference between the, the different instances. Um, and then we, we use um, a similarity metric where we take into account the, the constraints, 
the type constraints and the instance constraints and basically make a selection among the, has the highest number percentage of applicable conditions. Um, there are some details about the formula. You can look at the, at, 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 at the paper for that, but it's basically establishing our preferences based on the number of conditions that are selected. So in this case, when the method, once they're learned and you have the same situation uh, where we are transporting milk, which is perishable, then um, both of them would be applicable, but in terms of preferences, this will have a higher similarity, will have higher rating, and therefore this is the method that is selected. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's the one we end up using. Um, so we have a few experiments uh, with our ROSI tables, looking at precision and recall, and found that in, in, in some domains that are used in, in the literature, including in translog and transportation domains that have different kinds of liquids and other kinds of things. And we found out that indeed this method work better than, um, than, than other, other, other methods. Uh, let me discuss, let me change gears to, to show another, another, a different way to, to, to address this problem. Uh, so in the previous, in, the, in what I just described, I, did, I, I described method called inductive logic programming. Now I'm going to use a different AI technique called constraint satisfaction. This is tremendously useful. I, I'm not an expert on it, but I have used it here and I have seen over and over people use it for, for many different problems. Um, so I was happy when we could use it here. Um, the idea is the following. We, we have the same problem as before, they give me the task hierarchies and we, learned the, we want to learn the applicability conditions. So the idea is we're going to formulate the problem of learning those preconditions, those applicability conditions as a constraint satisfaction problem. So uh, we, we receive as input the traces. Automatically, we traverse these traces and extract some constraints. Automatically, using those uh, constraint solver, I solve those constraints and um, automatically we get the, the preconditions. And in this problem, we actually are learning only the preconditions of the methods, but we are also learning the operators, the preconditions and effects of the operators. Uh, so same terminology as before. The only thing I want to highlight is, uh, and, and I mentioned this before, alpha here denotes an atom in the state. The state is described by multiple atoms. Um, so then um, the kinds of constraints, so they give me as input, this will be an example of an input, right? A task hierarchy. Um, I, I know the primitive task, but I don't know the preconditions and effects. And I have these, these states annotated with before the task, after the task, before the task, and I have that as input. Um, and then I set a condition alpha here. Um, and I could formulate a few constraints. And, and some of these constraints might be incorrect. But here, in typical statistical fashion, uh, we are assuming that when it's very frequently, then the same condition happens very frequently, then it has to be true. Basically, the Google answer for everything, if, if, we are, if there is sufficient uh, support, then it will become true. So in this case, these are the examples of constraints that we are learning. So again, we're giving us input this trace. We observe a condition alpha, and we will say, oh, well, alpha is a precondition of this action. Because alpha occurs in the state before this action was applied. Alpha is a precondition of this method. So we have this method. In, in this method, methods are applied by looking at the state. Alpha was a condition on the state. So I'll say that alpha is a precondition for this method. Alpha occurs in this state after this action. So I'm going to say that alpha is an effect of this action. Um, and um, I will say that alpha is not a precondition. I will add as a, as a condition that alpha is not a precondition to T5 um, because, because it was in the effect. And again, um, it's possible if I take all of the atoms in the state, not all of them will be preconditions for this action. Um, but over time, if we have give sufficient number of traces, those that are the true precondition for this action will be over, will be, will be there. Um, and furthermore, we assign some weight to these constraints. So the, the number of times that we see uh, alpha being occurring before this action is applied, the, the more weight that that constraint will have. 
Um, and that's basically the kind of encoding that we will generate, of course, for, for multiple traces, for multiple decompositions, we'll generate hundreds or possibly thousands of these constraints. Um, but they are very good constraint, uh, constraint uh, uh, there's actually another competition of constraint satisfaction systems. The state of the art has advanced tremendously. Um, and we use it, we give it these constraints to a constraint satisfier. And then we will start learning things like this. Oh, this method has a precondition alpha. And that's because the constraint, you know, the, all of these constraints were given the constraint satisfier and we'll say some of these are true, others are false. And those that are true are the ones that are used to populate the preconditions and the effects um, uh, and preconditions of the, of the actions. So uh, we, uh, again, uh, this is um, the, in this figure showing the error rate. So we know the ground truth. We know which should be the, the, um, the correct preconditions for the methods. We know which should be the pre correct preconditions for the actions and the correct effects of the actions. And we found out that the system, um, you know, over over a high number of of input traces, was able to reduce the error substantially. It doesn't go to zero, um, and in part because the 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 the, the SAT solvers that are currently available, they 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 do approximation solutions, right? So the the problem of of computing a SAT set of constraints satisfying an input that problem is, is MP computer or hardware is intractable. Um, so these solvers actually run in polynomial time. How do they do it? They, they, they find an approximation. They will, they will find um, a large number of constraints that, that are, are satisfied, but some of them might not be satisfied. Some of them might be correct, a small number. Um, and, and so it doesn't go to zero, but, but, it, but it, goes, it goes very close. Uh, now let me change gears to learning the hierarchical structure and explain the work that we did. Uh, um, we have a system called HCM Maker. Um, is is um, given a simple again the collection of of, of traces and the annotated tasks, um, and in uh, in in is is incremental. So the more traces you give, the more methods it will learn. Uh, is sound in the sense that the methods are guaranteed to, so, so the, the, the tasks as I mentioned are simple, they're giving this annotation of what are the correct preconditions and effects. The methods are guaranteed to satisfy those tasks, preconditions and effects, so they are sound. Uh, so if you give me a collection of tasks and you say, these are the preconditions and effects, when we apply the methods and generate a plan, they will satisfy those preconditions and effects that you give them. Um, it's conditionally complete if you give a uh, sufficiently large and I guess diverse collection of problems, but finite. Uh, you can learn the, co the uh, complete collection of methods. And it's expressive. Uh, you could learn methods that um, are strictly more, rep more expressible than, than just using the operators. So you're getting expressiveness by, by learning this. Uh, this is the pseudo code. I will not go through the pseudo code. I, that would be too much, but I can explain the key, the key idea. The key idea is the following. So this is the input trace. These are the actions, and I mentioned they are annotated with intermediate states. We have the annotated task, so we know what are the preconditions and effects of the tasks. So we can say, for example, oh, in this case, the precondition of a task is satisfied in this state, and the effects of this task is satisfied in this other state. If that happens, then, um, this sequence of actions basically will apply, will, will achieve that task. So I can say that, oh, this, this collection of, uh, of, of actions satisfy that task. Uh, that's basically what I do. Not only that, but I could do what is called goal regression, which is a method that has existed for, for many, many years to identify what are the minimum set of conditions in this state that are needed to execute this sequence of actions. And therefore, I could basically learn the beginnings of a hierarchy because I would say, oh, this task can be decomposed into this sequence of actions and doing goal regression. These are the conditions in the state that has to be true in order to decompose that task into this sequence of actions. That's the key center idea of this, of this algorithm. 
and you may ask, well, but how do you obtain the hierarchies between tasks? Now it becomes simpler because suppose that we have identified the sequence of actions decomposing a task T. Again, the preconditions of T were matched here in the state before this action, and the effects of this of T were matched in the state after this action. So we have identified this set of actions subsuming this task. Similarly, for another task T prime, we have uh, an, uh, uh, subsumed by this sequence of actions. And this sequence of actions is a, is a super sequence of this sequence. Then I will say that this task T prime is a parent task of T, because I can, I can, I can for, uh, for accomplishing T prime, all I need to do is execute this action, then apply task T, and then finally apply this action. So that's how this, this sequence will generate. Uh, these, these hard task hierarchies are generated. Um, not only that, but I will be able to learn recursive action, the recursive tasks, the recursive task decompositions. Because um, if this task happens to be the same name as this task, then I will learn recursion. So it's able to learn recursion naturally. Um, uh, as you can imagine, if we are given many annotated tasks um, and, and many traces, there might be multiple ways that I can group things together and that establish a question of how we are going to group things together. And, um, and um, we, HCM Maker enforces a right recursive structure. I'll explain why, what does that mean exactly and why uh, we, we adopted. And I'm going to show later uh, some other work that we relax that. Uh, um, uh, these are some technical details. I, I don't want to get into that. Um, uh, this is an example of the hierarchy that is learned automatically. Um, so you have a delivered task. And it will decompose right recourses, so it will decompose into two subtasks. One is a primitive task, an action to unload the truck, and another one is the recursive task. So it's, it's, it's learning deliver this task, will first unload the truck, um, and then deliver. And that will be one method. And another method will say deliver this task, will load into the plane and deliver. So this is it has the right recursive structure. Um, and, and this is a, a domain called the logistic transportation domain that is used in the planning literature. Um, in this domain, we use a single uh, uh, task, a simple the delivered task. Uh, no precondition effects is the object is at a location. And basically, we are learning this right recursive structure. Um, and, and we perform a number of evaluations in, in, in different domains. And, and we get um, good results in terms of, of coverage um, of the domain uh, in most domains. I, uh, yeah, let, let's, let's look at this. I, I, I want to show good examples, uh, good results, but also bad results that are illustrative. So in this example, I'm showing 100% uh, means I was able to learn 100% of the domain. And this is the percentage of training data that are given. So look at this beautiful curve, this happy curve, this red, the red line. This is a domain. This is the logistics. Very rapidly, within 20% of the training data, is able to, to basically solve 95% 90, of the problems. And by 60%, it was able to solve all of them. Uh, the second domain, the satellite domain, also you know, is learning even faster. But look at this horrible one. This is the um, this is blocks world. I have mentioned this before. Look at this. I give 20%, it's certainly 20% of the problems, 40%, 40% of the problems. But look at this, it never, you know, even we give 100% of the training data, it's able to solve only 60% of the problems. And this is an illustration of something that I said earlier in this talk, that is that not all domains are amenable for hierarchical decompositions. And it, this is a puzzle-like domain, um, and it's not really good. Uh, to, to do that, and, and, and this is illustrated here. It's not able to, I mean, in the transportation domain is in, in contrast, it's a beautiful domain for that, because in transportation domain is saying, oh, I want to transport this package between these two locations, and you will say, first, I want to transport the package to the local airport. 
uh, and then I fly the airport, uh, the, 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 the package from one airport to the other one, and it has this natural hierarchical structure, and this is reflected here. Um, let me switch here for something I've been working recently, which is a variant of hierarchical task networks called hierarchical goal networks. And let me let me just just briefly explain why we've been looking into that. We have the same cognitive motivation for HCNs, the hierarchical decomposition problems into sub problems. But in in HD in 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 HGN, these goal networks, HGN goal networks, um, we in the hierarchy we represent goals, not tasks. Um, and there are a number of people who perform um, execution monitoring. This is somebody at NASA, I believe, who has rated pointedly that for this kind of domain where we are doing execution monitoring, we really want goal hierarchies. Um, and I can illustrate that with an example. Uh, this is my example, but it's paraphrased from one that Devorak had in his paper. I just converted into something that I will, will better understand. Suppose that we have a on, on the, underwater unmanned vehicle, a UUV, a submarine, basically automated, and um, um, and it was it was uh, underwater, and then a strong current uh, pushed the the submarine, the UUV, UUV, to some location, and now the UUV doesn't know where it is. So then it will establish its own goal to establish its current location. And therefore, you will, you will have two sub goals. So for example, go to the surface and, and, and do the GPS calibration and continue to decompose that into other sub goals in typical HGN or HGN fashion, decomposing the problem into sub problems. And it's going through that process and executing that plan. And while executing has not, it's so it started operation executing the plan. Suppose that a nearby buoy sent an automated message telling the UUV its location. So it said, okay, your location is this. At this point, um, there is no point in continuing executing this plan because the goal of this plan was to determine the location, but the goal has been established because we already know what our location is thanks to this buoy. Um, and uh, the, if we are using a task network, then tasks have no explicit meaning, which is fantastic for some, for some uh, other situations, but in this case, basically we will continue executing the, the task uh, without knowing that it has been already fulfilled. Um, uh, there is a, a, a somebody who's been his PhD at University of Maryland, College Park, um, Shiva Scar, and he wrote a dissertation on this topic, uh, and we adopted his representation. One of the interesting theoretical results is that these goal networks have the same expressiveness as a uh, total order HTM planning, which is the variant typically we use in most applications. Anyway, um, so, so we, we have been studying these frameworks, learning these goal networks. Um, and what we did is we, we give us input these, these traces, right? This is the same as before. <clears throat> but we decided to do something really different. We decided to be, convert the problem of learning um these hierarchies into a word embedding problem so that is we're giving these simple traces as before action state action action state action uh, we view each of these traces as text they are symbolic representations we view them as text meaning a trace is a sentence and each of the state conditions like for example uh, hector is at lehigh and, and we view that as one word each of the state conditions and the actions like travel from location one to location two as a word. And we give uh, this as input to uh, uh, what I'm getting to, we use one called word to vector. And we get the um, vector representations of each of these planning elements. So here you have, for example, the airplane, the airport, and these are vector representations. I should mention that I'm showing here a three dimensional vector. Um, in fact, it's not like that because um, these these vectors are multiple dimensions. I only put this for for illustration, um, otherwise it will not be visible. Um, and and we identify co-occurring elements of the plan. So the way this word to vector works is that in this word embedding techniques, it will look at what is called the context 
of every um, word, and in this case, for example, a uh, state condition uh, or, or, the, uh, or the actions, and we'll find co-occurring elements. So for example, oops, I, I, uh, there is, this is not an accident, uh, well, I, it's an, I, I draw this myself, but uh, this is the kind of thing that it would illustrate in that. It will find a close, close orientation between airport and airplane, and that is because airplanes need airports to, um, to land and to depart. So this kind of correlation between these two um, elements in the plan, it will be found automatically. Um, and we use that to, um, to learn the, the hierarchies. And, and I'm going to show you an illustration of an example in a moment. Um, so we learn a, a, a hierarchical structure because we have these vector representations. We run a clustering algorithm in this, uh, on those vector representations and we find those that are grouped together. And we say those correspond to one task. Um, and then we zoom in into each of these uh, clusters and divide into subclusters, and that's how we start obtaining the, the, the hierarchy. And we try in a domain look like the transportation domain, and look what happened. This is the depth of the hierarchy. This is what HTM Maker, the first word that I showed earlier today, you learned it right recursive, and this is the depth of the hierarchy, the depth of the tree going all the way from the root to the leaf. Um, and because it's right recursive, um, uh, it will continue increasing linearly with the length of the plan. Look how beautiful it is with, with, uh, with this word to vector, we are able to learn a hierarchy that are more balanced, even though the plan gets longer, um, basically we learn a decomposition of def four and, and it will stay there. So we're able to learn, to learn this. Um, so I can illustrate the kind of hierarchies with, with, a, with a, uh, an abstract example. Um, here we have uh, Jersey City, and here is Manhattan. And uh, suppose that we are so uh, we are um, uh, restricted to this area. So, and we are observing traces that goes from Jersey City to Manhattan. So basically, we restrict those traces to those that that don't go away from this, that restrict themselves to this area, we will find that every trace will take one of two routes to get to Manhattan. Either it goes through the Holland Tunnel or it will go to the Lincoln Tunnel. Yes, okay, and a few of those will take these boats that go through there, but most of them will take one of these two big routes. Um, and the, when we learn, learn the cluster analysis, those are the ones that will be um, very high. So these are, what is called a landmark, and uh, a landmark because, the, so let me eliminate this, suppose this, this is the only one. Suppose that, that the uh, Holland Tunnel is under repair, then um, this will be a planning landmark because it doesn't matter uh, what your starting location or your destination location, you will always go through the Lincoln Tunnel. And now these two are what it, we call partial landmarks, so because uh, basically it will go through either one. As it turned out, uh, we could zoom in into these areas and continue identifying other landmarks, and those are the, the kinds of uh, hierarchies that word to vector is finding. Uh, in, in, in the transportation domain, as I showed in the previous slide, it worked quite well. This is an example of a, of a hierarchy that is learned. You can see it's very balanced. If you recall the one for HTML maker was a right recursive, so you are not balanced at all, um, and it's able to learn that. Um, let me check the time. I have a little video, but in the interest of time, I will not show it. But there was a video, video of, in, a, in a video game of how this, this system works. Um, the last topic I want to talk now is um, the use of deep learning um, uh, for learning these hierarchies. But now the hierarchies will be implicit, but they, are, they will be there, uh, stored in, a, in the wonderful neural network. So, um, so consider the following task where we are exploring an environment um, and, and, and the robot is trying to classify the environment. So it doesn't know what the environment is trying to classify. Uh, the robot is, can only partially observe the environment and each uh, observation depends on the actions taken by the robot. So basically it knows the environment we has seen before, but it doesn't know what it has seen. Uh, we design a multi-layer architecture. It has basically two layers. One is the goal, so the, 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 
the agent is generating goals, and each of these goals is ex is achieved by the second layer, which uh, give a goal. It will plan to execute that goal. So we have this goal uh, that is being generated. Uh, when the goal is generated, this um, we have this planner that will start uh, achieving that goal, uh, and then go back to the next goal and so forth. This third layer here is because we have a, a classification task. We want to uh, we we want to identify what the environment is the one we are classic we are working on. And this is used for classification. So these three are interacting together. Um, so uh, this is a number between, uh, so here is showing the current location of the agent of the robot. And this is the goal where it's going to be. And we are trying to identify, there is a number hidden here and we are trying to identify what is the number. And we see this curve here. Um, so that perhaps could be, a, I don't know, a four maybe, or maybe a five. Um, anyway, um, the agent moves and now it has, it has traversed, this is a discovered this part. This might be a four, I will say probably. Uh, and now the agent, so blue is the current location and, and green is the goal, where it goes next. Uh, and yes, and at the end, it identifies four. So this is the, ar the architecture. Um, it uses convolutional layers to represent the goals. The goal is a vector, so the input is the observation from the state, which is represented as a vector, and the output is, is, is a vector that represents this goal. This vector, the goal, is giving us input to the action layer. So the action layer will receive the goal and the environment and execute a sequence of actions. And while it's performing this, whatever is being identified is running by the classifier. And I just say this work is, is led by, by a colleague Lehigh, who is doing robotics, Nader Moti and his students. Uh, we are collaborating with this because I'm interested in the hierarchical relations. So then we designed this, but um, this work have, well, is led by my colleague Nader. Um, so here is a, a, a video uh, that, that uh, they recorded for this. And, 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 and again, the, the green light is the goal the green square and the blue is the current location so here is showing this is the classification problem is trying to see with the zero and nine and based on what is what is traversing is determined with a high probability in this case for example the high probability is a six of course it doesn't see that this is for us for the ground truth and you can see that that is um that is trying to, to do that anyway does, does that and, and we get good results, a high accuracy of representation um, uh, with more training. And then I want to move to my final remarks. Um, I presented three alternatives for learning the uh, preconditions. One is inductive logic programming, that was the part about generalizing. The one is uh, constraint satisfaction. I didn't mention, but the solver that we use is a famous solver called the MaxApp. Um, uh, in goal regression in, in, in HTM Maker, we use goal regression to identify preconditions. So there are three different alternatives to, to the same to solve the same problem. Um, there are some uh, trade-offs here. For example, we record a simple ontology, but we have no operators. Um, here we have no operators in no ontology, uh, but the example that we learn might not be 100% correct. Um, and here um, we recap as input the, the examples uh, and the operators, and we, we are able to learn the, the preconditions of the method. So there are different trade-offs in terms of the kind of knowledge that is needed to be given. We also learn the show work for learning hierarchical structure, HTM Maker, the first one that I show is an algorithm capable of learning sound and complete domain descriptions for HTM planning. We see input is annotated tasks and the operators. A hierarchical goal networks as an alternative for HTNs that simplify execution monitoring activities. Uh, we give operators as input and represent this as, uh, and of course, uh, the, the task is and it, it learns the word embeddings and, and that's how the hierarchy is, is learned. Um, and um, more recently, we're looking at deep learning to learn these implicit goal hierarchies, right? The, the hierarchies are, are stored somewhere then in, in the top network. 
Uh, but these are goal hierarchies, basically a right recursive indicating um, what to execute next. Um, there are a number of works, and I have a student working on, 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 on this topic, on learning uh, numeric arguments, temporal conditions. Um, there are some bodies on non-determinism that we like to explore. Um, uh, what happened if the user decided to dilute, right? Uh, so, so many of these methods, you give thousands of, of examples of traces, but what if the, we have a user that is hand-picking particular examples? There are very few, but they are really good examples. Maybe we could learn from those. Um, you know, there is different where, where the where is changing over time. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you uh, for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, but I, I will um, ask for questions, but first, since uh, uh, I'm, I'm introducing you, I'll take the, the, uh, it, uh, the privilege of asking the first question, which is, um, uh, how do you get a large enough set of tasks and solutions to actually train your systems? Right. So this has been this has been a, 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 a problem from the, from the outset, and, and this is the way we we solve it. Um, uh, there is um, uh, a large number of planning systems, systems that receive as input uh, a state, goals, and a collection of operators and they will generate a plan automatically that satisfy those goals from that state. Uh, and we have used a variety of those planners to generate traces. Uh, and those are the ones that are, we have given as input to our learner. So the, 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 the answer there is we have generated those automatically using planning systems. Um, what, what we have not done and, and, and I think it would be fantastic if we could do it, would be some could real plans from some domain um, and, and give it and see what it learns there. So, so all of our, our testing uh, and all of these papers and work they report on, on traces that are automatically generated by planning systems. Okay. Uh, do we have other questions for, for Hector? Hi, hi Hector. It's Mike Redden. I, I work here in Metron's unmanned system division, so we do a lot of uh, underwater robotics, like you were alluding to. So, so I had a question about, um, so you were learning some traces, but you never learned from, say, broken traces, like a trace of a plan that was attempted to be executed but then failed for some reason. Do you, do you ever consider taking in plans such as that? <clears throat> Uh, actually, I, I didn't went into the level of detail. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the, um, let me see which one. Yeah, Maxat, uh, this constraint satisfaction problem, um, uh, actually also learn, le we learn from positive and negative examples. So um, in, in constraint satisfaction, uh, you can represent the negative examples and, 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 and you're able to learn from those. So, so we, have, we do have, that have work on that, on, on some of the examples being, being uh, negative. I, 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 I skip in my slide because I knew we would not have time, but um, uh, let me just, I'm not going to do that presentation. I'm just to just show you. The, these slides are hidden. I don't know if you see them. They are hidden. <laughs> um, and, and that's, they're hidden, but uh, they use another technique called version spaces. In version spaces, uh, you learn from both positive and negative examples. So some of the techniques do use that. And there is, a, there is of course, a, um, a, a good reason to use that. There, is, there are famous theorems in machine learning that shows that you give like 1 million positive examples, but then if you give like 100 positive examples and a few negative examples, you can learn the same concept. So, um, so actually, negative examples can be quite useful, and, and we have used them here. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions? Or comments, you know, anything, I'll be happy to. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so it's Mike again. Um, I, I had one other question. So you talked about learning from fully observable traces and partially observable traces. But did you mentioned a little bit at the end about dynamic networks? But I guess that the the other version would be that you have non-deterministic results of an action. So right. did you look at at those sorts of domains? Like, how do you learn a robust plan? Right. So so um. So yes, the answer is yes. We have looked into those. Um, so so um, th those domains are different, actually. The solution for those problems is no longer, so I, 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 in, in, I from the outset, I was making the assumption here for this presentation that the, the solution for any problem is a sequence of actions. And uh, you, know, you have a sequence of actions, uh, a plan, a sequence of actions, um, for those kinds of domains, the solutions are not plans because as you pointed out, if I'm in this state and I execute this action, there might, multiple, may, there might be multiple different states that I can reach out from executing that action. So the solutions for those kinds of domains is not our plans, they are what is called policies. And, and a policy basically is um, a, a solution that indicates if you're in a particular state, this is the action that you can take. We are in particular state. This is a, an action that you can take. Um, and we have, we have, we do have uh, a study problems uh, of non-determinism. Let me go to see if I don't know if I have any of these um, listed here. Um, they are not listed here, but um, we, we do have learned um, HCN domains for situations where the domain is non deterministic so you learn the methods but uh, these methods are used by by a planner to generate a policy um let me let me just um, just go back here um, i i'm going to go to my I, I, I'm, yeah this is um determinism um yes um, uh, this is a paper published at AAAI, is learning hierarchical planning for non-deterministic planning domains. So what, 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 what this does is you're learning the methods, but the planning system that uses those methods will generate a policy. And the policy is robust because then it doesn't matter in which state you are, it will have always an action that it can, that it can choose from. So we have, we have done uh, work on that. I don't want to give the impression that this is a solved problem because um, non-determinism is just the beginning, right? There are other domains that they are probabilistic where not only the actions are, are non-deterministic, but you have some probability distribution associated with them. So for example, if I, uh, again, and I'm, I'm thinking about games because that's what we use, but um, in, in if, if a character, um, uh, swings a sword to hit another character with 90% probability to hit the other character and with 10% probability it will fail. Uh, so those kinds of domains um, you will need, you know, learning HTMs for those kind of domains will also need, need a refinement because now you need to take into account those probability conditions. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this is Zach. Uh, I'm an intern here going into my second year at UVA. Uh, on the slide with HGNs where you had the UUV that could either surface or to find its location, mm -hmm. uh, is there any work that's been done to incorporate risk into that sort of model? So if surfacing has some sort of negative potential impact? Excellent question and the short answer is no. Not that I'm aware. That would be something that you could explore, right? So. So absolutely. So now I, I now I have a collection of methods, and the methods um, one of them says go to the surface. Um, and right now you are just looking to see whether you can achieve the plan, um, but but you could have some preferences indicating that applying that method learn or learn some preferences indicating that applying that method could be risky and therefore uh, you know and take that into account. I don't know of any work doing that, and I think that would be that would be of, of, of great interest. Yes, of exploring that. I, you know, despite despite me having worked on this problem for many many years, 
I, I always feel like I'm only scratching the surface, that there are a number of like, you know, every day, I, I, I have not thought about what you, what you, what you said, but, um, but indeed, this is, this is uh, an, an, an interesting problem to look at, and I'm not aware of anyone who has looked at it. Thank you. You're welcome. And any other uh, questions or comments for Professor uh, Hector Munez Avila? Munoz Avila. Yeah, yeah, please, please call me Hector. Hector, <laughs> Hector. okay. <clears throat> in, in, in There's a way, question. I, I am, I, go ahead. They had a question here, I believe. Excuse me. This is Andre Rukin from Metron. Uh, what's a good heuristic or what's a good rule of thumb to apply to decide whether or not this hierarchical approach works or a problem is suitable or not for hierarchical uh, decomposition what uh, if you i gave you block world and you knew nothing about it how would you know if it's good or not yeah i so um i'm going to give you a good question and, and you got me thinking i'm going to give two answers on top of my head the first answer on top of my head is um many of these domains is not is natural and one would recognize that there is some hierarchical relation there in, in something like transportation domain or many of these military domains they have a hierarchy is natural uh, that's one answer the other answer is you can use what we did with word to vector right so you, you, you give the trace if you have the traces you can give it to word to vector and see whether hierarchies are learned if if the if the hierarchy structure that is that is that is obtained look more flattened, so this one let me see where was that. I'm trying to get to that one slide. Uh, this is the one. So so this is like a you run the your your your, your traces and give that input and, and and you get something like this that that would that will that I guess strong evidence that there are these basically landmarks and the, the domain has this nice structure. Um, I have not tried it on something like blocks work, but what I suspect will happen is it will be more flattened. It will be more like flattened here, and then nothing pops up. Then, then probably that would indicate that that domain is not suitable for this kind of solution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Well, Hector, so. Uh... I think I don't hear other questions. Um, so I'll turn the floor over now to uh, Van Gurley, our CEO, for a few closing remarks here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And sorry that we had to do this remotely and weren't able to host you in person. Um, <laughs> appreciate you, uh, you joining us. I mean, a very interesting talk. And as some of the folks have alluded in the questions, uh, it, there, it, it, there are strong similarities and relationships to some of the work we are doing. Um, and I appreciate everybody, both from Metron and from the broader community, GMU and others who have joined us today. Uh, it's our honor to be able to host these things, and uh, we look forward to hopefully having uh, continued conversations with you, Hector, about some possible joint efforts. Um, so with that, thank you very much uh, and for, for a great afternoon and a great uh, discussion. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Hector, that was terrific. I, uh, very good talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay, everyone. Okay, goodbye.